Hey everyone, welcome to the show. I'm here today again with Yevgeny Shanchenev. Yevgeny, hello, good morning, how are you? Good morning, very happy to be here. I'm good, how are you? I'm great, thank you. This is appearance number two. Can you believe it? <laughs> Indeed, and in a very short space of time. In a, yeah, pretty short space of time. So we won't be covering what we covered last time, which was only maybe a few weeks ago, I guess now. So uh, if anyone wants to catch up, they can uh, go do so. But I think your reputation precedes you and you've got a huge fan club that follows you around, apparently. So we'll, we'll, we'll see it. I get a lot of, I got, I've gotten a lot of feedback. Oh yeah, watch the episode with Evgeny, just see what he's up to. That's amazing. <laughs> That's cool to hear. I hope this one yeah. is going to be just as good. I'm sure, I'm sure. Your fan club is, you know, they're, they're always pleased by you. You just have to turn up. Yeah, all three of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot more than that. Okay, cool. So, uh, Yevgeny, you were the uh, CEO of Makers Academy, a uh, London-based uh, coding boot camp, which was, you know, doing really, really well. Uh, I think we covered this already. Um, and I don't mean to put any other boot camps down. I'm sure there's lots of amazing boot camps, but Makers Academy is very highly rated and uh, is, is doing great. You then decided to leave uh, about a year or two ago um, and uh, to pursue um, your new career as an executive coach. So that's what today we're going to have a deep dive into executive coaching. But if, yeah, yeah, excellent. I know, I know. This is this is why I'm so excited. I can't believe you agreed to a second show, you know. <laughs> so so look, before we touch on executive coaching, help me get um, under your skin a little. Help me understand the psychology. So what happens at Makers that prompts you to want to move on? At Makers... And for context, I uh, founded the company in uh, early 2013 and left in uh, August last year. So I was full-time focused on uh, building and running this company for seven and a half uh, years. Um, one thing which I can't really deny <clears throat> uh, was the impact of uh, my work on uh, uh, my mental health. Uh, Everyone has mental health, as uh, as they say, and uh, the ongoing pressure of uh, running and growing uh, a startup, especially as a first-time CEO, which I was, uh, uh, was there. Uh, it's uh, it was maybe not the only uh, not the only thing which prompted me to uh, to consider stepping down, but it was uh, definitely one of the uh, key factors. I could no longer ignore. Uh, the price I was paying uh, with uh, my well-being. So you mentioned um, two things, your mental well-being, which of course is extremely important, and you mentioned pressure as well. Now, you, in all the time I've known you and your fan club will probably uh, agree with me that you're not the kind of person who can't handle pressure. And, you know, you've probably put yourself into positions like that many, many times. So I assume it's not the pressure that drives the, the lack of wellness, but it's something else? It's uh, probably the way how I uh, dealt with pressure and, uh, and also how much self-inflicted pressure and self-judgment uh, was there. When I talk about pressure, it's not pressure coming from uh, the outside. I'm not talking about clients or investors or my senior management team uh, or the like. Uh, the pressure always comes from uh, uh, the inside. It's what we internalize, what we create as expectations that we uh, put uh, on ourselves, and uh, that can be uh, that can be uh, quite a lot. And yes, I dealt with it more or less successfully uh, uh, over a number of uh, uh, the, over a number of years. But at the same time, uh, at some point, I had to wake up to the fact that uh, I'm really not looking forward to the vast majority of uh, my days in the office. Mm, and that's a terrible position to be in, I suppose, especially for something that was, for, you know, your baby, I guess, you know, you, you saw it grow up. To say that it's a terrible position would be an overstatement, I'd say, because I was also in an incredibly lucky position. It's a privilege to be running your own company, which is successful delivering uh, good results for the clients and, uh, 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 even being in a position to contemplate that I have an option to step down, uh, high, uh, hire a new CEO to run the company going forward and um, just do something else, it's a very, very uh, privileged position to be in. So while not everything was easy, I also want to acknowledge that 
uh, I did have a lot of options. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I've heard a, a lot about this new CEO uh, of yours. I was catching up with Nikesh last week, um, and I think I need to reach out to her and uh, see if I can get her on as well. Maybe I'll if be, I drop I'll your be, name. I'll be happy to introduce. Okay, beautiful. Uh, there's another episode in the bag. Um, so now, now you, you know, you say, sorry, I don't want to dwell on this too long. I've just got one last question. So, you know, what sort of things start to change that you have this internal pressure or you start to feel unhappy? Like what's the shift from the old days to the current state? So one of the things which was happening in parallel uh, was uh, the shift from uh, was the shift from our focus on uh, uh, only training students, as we did in the beginning, to training students and delivering a suite of uh, uh, services to uh, our enterprise uh, customers. And this, uh, but this is a good shift from a business strategy perspective. We need to place our developers, find them new, uh, uh, great jobs, and uh, this is why we're working with uh, a wide range of uh, enterprise uh, partners. However, this did change the nature of uh, my job quite significantly, uh, quite significantly over the years, which also led me to the realization that uh, I was not the best uh, CEO for the company going forward. When uh, me and the board of directors were thinking about, okay, what's what do we want to see happen in the next year, three, five, uh, ten? We uh, saw the future, which made a lot of sense for uh, the company, and. At the same time, uh, I also had to admit that uh, a CEO with a different background and a different skill set would be better suited to lead the company into the future. And uh, the, com the combination of the fact that, of two facts, that on the one hand, I really wasn't enjoying much of my job as a CEO, and at the same time, the realization that maybe someone else would gen genuinely, objectively be better to deliver on the strategy that made, say, uh, that made sense for the company was the combination of uh, was, it, was the combination that led to uh, led to the decision to uh, step down and uh, hire uh, another CEO. I mean, that must have been a very difficult decision for you to make. That I'm sure it took a while. Um, yes, uh, and at the same time, I also had plenty of time to make it. So mm. uh, while I was under the some internalized pressure of running the company, I was not under uh, that, uh, any kind of time pressure. So this question of, okay, what's the right thing to do? I had as much time as I needed to uh, contemplate it, which is again, an incredibly privileged position to be in because making big decisions under uh, time pressure is generally not a good idea. And I suppose to an extent, they, they say, you know, as businesses scale, you know, you certain key staff might want to or need to be changed to continue the growth. Is, uh, there, is there an element of that? There is a huge element of this. We've got, we've got this myth that uh, a single person is supposed to be uh, great at everything, as, at coming up with an idea of getting from an idea to uh, early customers and product market fit, for, of getting from there to uh, scale uh, by building the machine, which uh, uh, is the company, and then uh, by selling the company and then even maybe running it uh, post exit, and these are very very different jobs. The job of a founder who starts the company, the job of the early stage CEO who gets the company through the first few years of just figuring out what we are doing, the job of a later stage CEO who takes something that works and gets it to a, a much bigger scale, uh, all of these are fundamentally different jobs. And sometimes the same person is great at all of them. Like we all know Jeff Bezos from Amazon and Mark Zuckerberg from uh, Facebook and many, uh, and many other uh, famous companies. But nonetheless, these are very different jobs that require different skill sets. And this is also one of the reasons, as you say, why uh, key people at uh, growing companies sometimes, sometimes change. I'm really glad. Um, oh, well, thank you for being so open about uh, uh, the issue with your own mental well-being. Not to overplay it, I'm sure there was nothing terribly wrong, but of course we have all have to recognize these things, you know, when they happen. And um, I feel like generally people are becoming more accepting of things like that. So, uh, can you tell me then how you dealt with that? How do you get better? I did uh, a number of things. Uh, I don't think there was one single magic bullet, but uh, 
uh, I sought professional help, which really helped as a, which really made a difference in terms of, uh, uh, seeing a psychiatrist, uh, working with a therapist and, uh, so on. That was helpful. Uh, I, uh, uh, engaged in a regular meditation practice. It was, uh, it was actually my first, uh, encounter with, uh, depression in, uh, 2016, which prompted me to really understand how my mind works. And that was the point when I started sitting on the cushion on a daily basis without, uh, without excuses, just, uh, just, uh, working on this. So this helped a lot. Um, being open with, uh, my uh, team and my family and my board about it, uh, was also very helpful. Just there is a huge amount of difference between suffering and silence and being able to say, Hey, this is happening. It doesn't mean dumping the problem on someone else. It doesn't mean, uh, giving up. It just acknowledging that this is happening. What, uh, what do we do about it? Mm. Um, uh, what else? Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 and of course, uh, taking breaks and, uh, reflecting on, uh, okay, if this is not working and something is not quite right here, why is it happening? And what, uh, and what, uh, could be a different thing to do. And these reflections over the years, often with the help of, uh, my executive coaches, uh, helped me to actually realize that a different line of work, uh, could be, uh, could lead to high well-being, better uh, professional results, while still giving the company what uh, what it needs to do to thrive uh, going forward. If you're enjoying this podcast, make sure to check out Electronic Specifier Insights. Their editors dig into the electronics industry, how new tech is shaping our post-COVID world, reviews from all the top electronics shows, and the latest tech electronic companies are releasing. You can find them by searching for Electronic Specifier Insights on any streaming service or by going to electronicspecifier.com slash news slash podcast. Uh, talking about uh, therapists there, that's a wonderful segue, I guess, into executive coaching. Um, so you were kind enough to give me uh, my first executive coaching session and it was it was amazing. Thank you. And it was an eye opener for me. You're welcome. One of one of the things that stands out to me really is you sent me a slide deck to sort of go over uh, before we had our session so that, you know, I could be a little bit uh, better prepared and we can make the most of our time. And something really interesting to me was this sort of distinction or the categories where therapy goes as opposed to coaching. So uh, therapy is traditionally concerned with uh, the past, healing what, uh, what happened in uh, in the past and making sure it doesn't show up too much, uh, in the present, uh, usually, uh, therapy focuses on, uh, things like things that get in the way. Like, for example, I talked to my therapist about, uh, my childhood and my fears and my anxieties, and we're trying to connect the dots to better understand how I function today as the result of what might've happened in the past, but, uh, coaching, uh, focuses on the present and the future. While the past comes up in coaching almost inevitably to some extent, uh, the main focus is on what's going on right now. Where do you want to go personal and professional? And what does it make, uh, and what, what does it mean for the choices you are going to make? So yes, the past is part of the picture, but the, the real focus is not on feeling better today, but on, uh, achieving different results or becoming a different person, uh, tomorrow. Mm, yeah. And we're going to dive much deeper into that in, in just a moment. Um, can you tell me about your executive coach and your experiences being coached? So, uh, I worked with, uh, several executive coaches, uh, over the years, uh, in my role as a CEO of makers, and all of them have been really helpful to, uh, to really understand something about myself, to learn something, uh, important, which would help me professionally and personally. But the most powerful encounter with coaching was, uh, the first one when in, uh, 2015, I, uh, went to, uh, a leadership training program called, uh, a CEO bootcamp, uh, which was, uh, run, which is still run by, uh, a company called, uh, reboot, uh, founded and led by, uh, a wonderful executive coach, uh, uh, called, uh, Jerry Colonna. And that was my first encounter with, uh, coaching. It really, 
uh, it really changed me uh, as a leader. And I think this was the moment when I really became a CEO. First time in experience, but nonetheless, that was the moment when I transitioned from being a founder to being a chief executive. And Jerry Colonna, I mean, that's a, that's a very big name. I, I assume many of our um, audience will will um, know that name, um, especially from the tech, the VC, and then the uh, authoring and uh, now coaching space. Um, I, I I actually remember that period. Um, uh, so this was after I went to Makers, and then I was working at Makers. That's cool. Tell, tell, tell me more. Yeah. I, I, I remember, and I remember uh, uh, someone telling me, oh, yeah, Yevgeny's not going to be here next week. He's going to um, uh, Las Vegas or something uh, for a CEO boot camp. Colorado. <laughs> Color, yeah, whatever it was. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that sounds like a great holiday. <laughs> but no, but honestly, I know we spoke, I think, a week ago, and I, and I, and I didn't tell you my thoughts on this, so I'm going to tell you now. I did remember thinking, well, you know, Taking Yevgeny out of the picture, I don't understand this. Like, what is a CEO bootcamp? Why would anyone need this? And I assume it's just a way to one waste money and two go and and have have a great time, you know, it, it, in in the desert somewhere or something, you know, or, or in Colorado mountains, you know, uh, go skiing, you know, ha- have a little bit of wine. Um, but then I also thought, well, you know, I know Yevgeny quite well, and he doesn't seem like much of a time waster or money waster to me, and he seems like a really smart and nice guy. So I'm sure there's a lot more to this, but I didn't understand it beyond that, to be honest. Well, me neither. I didn't really understand it at the time. Uh, and as I said, I had no experience with uh, executive coaching, leadership de- development. It was really my uh, uh, my first encounter. So uh, I I was going there thinking we would talk about business and strategy and hiring and you know, all the usual uh, challenges that uh are obvious on the surface, but in fact, we spent uh, several days, uh, Jerry, his team, uh, and uh, 12 other CEOs, including me, we spent uh, several days talking about our feelings, our fears, our dreams, our childhood, uh, but not in a therapeutic kind of way, but in a way that connects to how we show up as CEOs today. What does it mean for our work uh, in the office? What uh, does it mean for the products we are building or the customers we are serving, how we are making decisions? So it was really a, a very big exercise in uh, self-awareness, which uh, really uh, which really changed, uh, changed uh, uh, how I lead. In particular, I learned uh, how to acknowledge and bring, uh, bring up emotions in the workplace. Instead of just pretending that emotions don't belong to the office, I uh, learned how to uh, acknowledge them and uh, how to notice their influence on uh, myself and uh, others and how it shows up uh, uh, shows up uh, in the office. Uh, just as importantly, uh, and this is, and this may sound strange out of, maybe out of context, but I also learned how, to, I also learned that I uh, belong in a sense that up, up until then, I felt like, Everyone else knows what they are doing as a CEO or as a founder of their company. Everyone else has got it together and I'm the only one struggling. And there I learned that I belong in a sense that every other CEO who was there was facing the same challenges in different contexts, in a different company, maybe different number of employees or different products. But fundamentally, uh, the job and the challenges was the same for uh, everyone. And that was in an incredibly empowering feeling that I'm not alone at this. So then you say you had no idea that that's what was coming. Yep. And you just, you, but you happily go to this thing. Like what, what motivates you to engage in this process? So, uh, what prompted me, uh, was a, was watching, uh, a presentation or a talk, uh, which, uh, Jerry gave, uh, at one of the festivals in, uh, uh, 2014. I just came across it uh, by accident on uh, Twitter while well, just uh, uh, just uh, browsing the web, and something about the way Jerry was talking about uh, startups really touched me. He described b- running a startup as standing still while your hair is on fire. In this metaphor, standing still while your hair is on fire 
really stayed with me. I watched <laughs> 40 minutes of the presentation and I thought, I don't, I've got no idea who this guy is, but he knows something which is really important and I want to learn. And then I Googled his name. I went to his website. I saw that, oh, uh, he's running CEO boot camps and I'm a CEO and there is a, the, and there is a new date coming up in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and so I applied and I did hesitate a lot. Uh, it was a lot of, it was uh, a lot of money. Uh, I spoke to my co-founder. I spoke to the board. Uh, both told me that yep, makes sense to invest in leadership development, and uh, it's a credible organization. And uh, uh, so I went, and I'm very glad I went. And then this now, so fast forwarding slightly uh, now onto what we're actually meant to be talking about. So tell me about uh, your uh, experience now as an executive coach. So. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, I stepped down uh, as a CEO in August last year, uh, retrained as an executive coach with uh, the Academy of Executive Coaching. Uh, and uh, uh, I've been uh, uh, working with uh, uh, my own clients, the leaders in the, uh, in the startup space uh, the, ever since. Uh, it's a great joy and privilege to serve startup leaders and help other people to navigate the challenges that I know too well from uh, personal experience. And uh, this is the kind of work which gives me joy uh, as opposed to giving me a sense of uh, dread. So in terms of the experience of actually doing the work and creating value and helping others, there is a world of difference between uh, what I'm doing right now and what I was doing uh, a few years ago. This is, and by the way, this is not to say that I will never ever be a CEO again, I'm a wealth I may well start another company at some point uh, in the future, and uh, uh, I know how to I know how to uh, run a company and do a job of a chief executive. But uh, for now, I'm so focused on uh, helping other startup leaders to uh, to grow in self awareness and uh, uh, lead more fulfilling lives. When you start your next company, can I please be a shareholder? <laughs> Let's talk about it when I. When I do. <laughs> Okay, sure. Maybe you can give my audience a heads up and we can do a little Kickstarter or something for you. Sounds good. <laughs> give everyone a piece of the pie. This is really interesting because your kind of style is that you kind of prefer the more personal relationships, right? You, you don't want to deal with 10,000 people. You want to deal with one person. Uh, yes, I'm, I think one thing I learned is that I prefer smaller scale in, uh, in many respects. I'd rather have few close friends than lots of social acquaintances. I'd rather, uh, have a small number of clients with whom I've got deep relationship as opposed to, uh, 10,000 subscribers. Uh, I'm, uh, I focus and optimize for, uh, deep, meaningful, uh, relationships and, uh, that's one of the reasons, that's one of the insights which uh, led me to, uh, to executive coaching. Now, I'm aware of some of the reasons why um, uh, a person in your position or like, let's say a manager or C or D level exec might want to have an executive coach uh, or a mentor or both or something like that. Um, for people who are maybe in this, uh, at that level or going into that level uh, and maybe are not aware of this or don't feel like they need it. Can you, can you explain to them what the purpose is of an, of an executive coach and why they might want to consider it? Uh, yes. Uh, first let's draw the line between coaching and mentoring because this line is uh, important. So, uh, mentors are usually more senior and more experienced than, uh, people that, uh, they work with, uh, they are usually in the same, uh, same line of work. So for example, a more experienced um, chief financial officer, uh, can be as a mentor to a more, uh, junior, uh, of, uh, accountant, just helping them to grow in the profession and do their job well in the mentorship relationship. Uh, the focus is on sharing the experience, sharing best practices, maybe sharing, uh, contacts and, uh, uh, stories from the past in order to help the person to do the job better. Uh, Mentorship is great, but it's different from coaching. Uh, coaching uh, has a countless number of definitions, but one of the 
One definition which I like is that it's a creative and thought-provoking uh, process, which is focused on developing the potential and growing the person uh, as a whole. And this does translate into performance. And performance is at the center of uh, coaching in some shape or form. But the focus is on deepening the self-awareness of the person and helping them to take responsibility for uh, for their uh, actions. One of the one of my uh, one of the phrases which I picked up from uh, Jerry Colonna actually uh, on that uh, CEO bootcamp uh, six years ago is this being so so what. So this being so is about what's happening right now, what's really going on. Looking at the reality, looking at the moment as honestly as possible, and then asking so what, not in a dismissive way like so what, but in a way, so what are you going to do about it? What are you going to choose to do about it? And uh, the, what I think many, most, if not all leaders find, is that navigating these questions in, in your own head is not nearly as efficient as working with uh, someone else. Uh, a coach doesn't, unlike a mentor, a coach doesn't come with uh, answers. A coach doesn't tell the client what to do. A coach doesn't come with uh, a wealth of experience, even though it might be part of, uh, it might stay somewhere in the background. The coach is there to ask questions, raise self-awareness and help the client to see the situation from a different perspective and make different choices that will result in uh, different outcomes. And someone like you, a coach such as yourself, and I believe your website is yevgeny.coach. Is that right? Yeah. And that's exactly uh, www.yevgeny.coach. And uh, uh, it's, it's spelled Evgeny, but we pronounce it Yevgeny. Yeah. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes if people Thank want you. to go have a look. What sort of people are you looking for to coach? Do you, do you have, I know you can't talk about any specifics or your clients, but do you have clients you've picked yet? Do you know what kind of person you want to coach? Uh, so I'm working with uh, startup leaders. And while I can't uh, talk about any, uh, anyone individually because of uh, confidentiality reasons, uh, there are uh, several uh, testimonials on my website. So you can, uh, uh, you can get an idea of the people that uh, I work with by uh, going online and uh, uh, seeing what others have to say about uh, my coaching. So uh, if, uh, having said that, I work with uh, startup leaders, people who are founders, CEOs, but also members of uh, the C-suite who are working in high growth companies and uh, are dealing with the kind of challenges which I faced over the years at Makers. High uncertainty, uh, internalized pressure to grow, uh, the need to make sure that the business uh, survives and uh, thrives and delivers a good product to uh, the customers and the uh, constant ongo ongoing change. And I, I suppose part of the process is to help um, uh, unearth the answers that are within your clients. Uh, exactly. That's, uh, that's one of the f uh, fundamental assumptions of uh, coaching that the client has the answer. The clients are not, uh, the clients are not uh, weak or broken or uh, ignorant. Uh, I see my clients as uh, resourceful, curious people who have all the answers. And my job as a coach is to help them to discover what they know already. Mm. Uh, it's, it's actually fairly rare that a coach brings uh, something new into, uh, into the uh, conversation in terms of specific knowledge or specific advice. It happens, but it's generally rare. Uh, the job of a coach is to help the person to make the most out of the existing situation uh, using whatever uh, knowledge and experience they uh, already have. And the assumption being that um, they, uh, through answer. no fault, yeah, they have the answer and there's some confusion or lack of clarity. Yep. That's not a fault of their own. Yep, uh, there is some confusion, lack of clarity. There are unhelpful mental patterns. Uh, sometimes we need external help to actually be able to see and accept what's uh, what's going on. Uh, but uh, the coach is not there to give answers. The answers need to be uh, need 
the answers uh, should come from the client. That was definitely a revelation for me because I thought when we were going to have our coaching session, you would just give me a whole bunch of answers. Um, and it turned out that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so t t tell me, uh, uh, Sanjay, tell me about your experience. What, what was it like for you to be, mm -hmm. uh, to be coached? I thought it was really good. I mean, if, if nothing else, I mean, obviously it was just, it was, uh, it was a one, it was like one session and, you know, so there's a lot of preparation, I guess, that went into that. So, you know, for me, it was about understanding what this relationship is and, you know, what, what I can get out of it. And that made me, um, you know, take account of a lot of things and put a lot of thought into things that I hadn't stopped and slowed down to, you know, think about. Uh, so I felt like that was very, very helpful, very useful. And um, I guess suppose talking through my problems with you definitely unearthed a lot of issues I felt. Um, and it's it's been helping me along for sure. Uh, and I, it's, as you said, I didn't, I didn't provide any answers. I just asked you no. about, I just asked you questions about what you were doing anyway. Mm, mm, and, that's right. and nonetheless, it helped you to see what you are doing and what you are trying to achieve in a, uh, in a new light, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I know you're doing executive coaching and you're focusing on startups. Um, but I mean, to, to an extent, what we're talking about here, I feel is kind of like just being uh, a better person, you know, being able to help other people. Am I, am I wrong here? You're right. Yes. Uh, and where executive bit uh, comes in is, uh, is that the challenges we're focusing on uh, with my clients come from the professional domain. So uh, a lot of principles and foundations of uh, coaching are the same, whether it's executive coaching, life coaching, or any other kind of coaching of which there are many. But mm -hmm. the executive coaching uh, specifically focuses on helping executives to be, helping executives, startup leaders to be the best at uh, what what they do uh, what they do in their uh, in their business. So while other areas of life, uh, personal interest and maybe challenges on the personal side uh, inevitably come into the picture, the main focus is still on how do we make sure that uh, the performance of uh, uh, the performance of uh, this person is uh, as uh, uh, as good as uh, it can be. And the way we get there is not by focusing narrowly on performance, but focusing more widely on um, on making sure that uh, the person, the executive in question, is as brave, as self-aware, as courageous uh, as they can possibly be. And this, in turn, leads to better results. Okay, so I think I've got clarity there. So your uh, your focus is on uh, is on the business domain. So helping that person to make money better business decisions and be a better person themselves. Uh, yes. And feel better in the process because mm. not only because it's an important in itself, but also when we feel better, when we accept ourselves, we make better decisions, we build better relationships, we see better results. It's funny. You mentioned there, um, like uh, sports coaching, this was something, um, this was, you know, a, an assumption of mine that I kind of asked you, well, you know, um, sports coach or like a manager is more like a coach that just tells people what to do. Right. And you were telling me that even, you know, that space has evolved now and people are seeing that actually there's a better way to do it. Um, yes, actually business coaching, executive coaching came from uh, sports coaching many decades ago when, uh, someone realized that the principles that they are deploying in uh, coaching sports people, uh, tennis players, uh, skiers, uh, could also be applied to the uh, business domain. And the key shift there was, as you've said, from um, telling the person what to do to raising their self-awareness by asking them questions about what's going on uh, already. So, the, so for example, if you imagine working with or coaching a tennis player, uh, one way to help them could be to uh, point out their mistakes or maybe demonstrate how to serve a ball and uh, tell them what they could be doing better. That could be one intervention. Or another could be to raise their awareness by asking questions like, um, tell me about what's the most efficient and the least efficient part of your uh, serve. Why do you think you are making a uh, uh, your biggest uh, mistake. Tell me about how uh, your uh, entire body feels uh, in the process as you 
uh, as you serve the ball. Uh, what does it tell you about uh, the trajectory of the ball, how it's going forward? And the funny thing is, in order to work in this way, you may not even have a tremendous amount of expertise as a tennis player uh, yourself. The skill of raising someone's awareness and the skill of playing tennis are well, just uh, uh, two different uh, skills. So that was also the insight which prompted someone to realize that uh, actually, it's possible to help someone improve their performance without being necessarily at, uh, an expert in uh, their field, although I would say it uh, often helps. That's very interesting. So so now um, walk me through the coaching process when you get a new client. Uh, what kind of things happen in those early days? So we... Uh, kick off uh, by uh, arranging a, uh, a discovery session, which is a 90-minute call, uh, which um, in which I would say about 30 minutes are spent on uh, talking about the goals, backgrounds, uh, my coaching philosophy, their expectations. So really just getting to know each other. Uh, and then uh, we set aside uh, approximately 60 minutes to uh, have a one-off uh, coaching session uh, in order to help uh, them to understand what what I do as a coach and how I come across, and also for me to really get to know uh, get to know the uh, potential client. Uh, this discovery session is a one off session. It's uh, free, so uh, there is no expect there are no strings attached or uh, any expectations. And uh, the point of this uh, this call is to find out whether a potential client would like to work with me as a coach, and whether I, as a coach, believe that I can help. Uh, this person. So following the discovery session, I uh, write an email uh, in which I explain that, uh, yes, I would, uh, I believe I can add value here and I would like us to work together and this is how, or uh, I don't think that I'm the right coach I, or I don't think I can add value here for the following reasons. And these are possible alternatives. So for example, as a coach, um, uh, I may realize uh, that someone came to me to talk about coaching, but maybe they would be better served by a therapist. And in this situation, my job is to say that, look, the problem that you are present, presented is real, but it's not in my domain. And I'm not qualified or trained to uh, deal with it, but here are the people uh, who are. So uh, this is the first discovery session and uh, the decision, uh, the mutual decision to uh, work together. And uh, then we decide on uh, the desired outcome, so what we're trying to, to get out of coaching. And from there, uh, we figure out how many uh, sessions do we want to uh, do we want to see, how long, how frequent. So some people prefer to work weekly, some, uh, but with some clients we meet every couple of weeks, with others every three weeks, and the sessions range between 60, and, uh, 60 minutes and uh, two hours. So, so we discuss all of this, and it's... Uh, uh, custom made for uh, every client. And is there like, I mean, you say it's custom made. Is there any, are there any standards that have to, that generally speaking, every client will get, or is it truly just 100% bespoke? There are common approaches and frameworks and lessons, which um, I bring into my coaching in general. Uh, and at the same time, when I reflect on the, how my coaching sessions are going with uh, different uh, different clients and how I show up as a coach with the different clients, they are incredibly different. I uh, I do quite different work with uh, uh, different people depending on uh, their needs and uh, uh, their situation. So what's uh, what matters here is the coaching relationship, which is built between uh, two people. Uh, and this relationship is is as unique as any deep relationship in uh, in uh, any context. Typically speaking, what's the kind of thing that people hope to gain out of this, or that you hope to give them out of this? Startup leaders come to executive coaching uh, with a range of uh, with a range of uh, challenges, which uh, may include. Um, managing a work-life balance or dealing with uh, pressure and work uh, at work or growing uh, growing as a leader with a company and making sure that uh, 
declines or that they stay uh, at top leader when the company is 10 people, 50 people, 100 people, and uh, and more. Uh, or uh, it may be some vague sense of dissatisfaction that something is not quite right, but they can't put a finger on it. And we may drill into it and realize that maybe they want to leave their company, but they never said it even to themselves. Uh, or uh, it may be... A, uh, if, uh, or it may be a focus on a specific area of their performance. For example, they don't know how to deliver uh, feedback or they don't know how to build a relationship with uh, their board or how to manage the pressure of fundraising, which is time consuming with the pressure of run running the company, which is also time consuming. So uh, it can range from very specific and very tactical as in running my senior management team all the way to uh, fairly high level, such as, uh, I'm not quite sure that, um, the work that I'm doing is in line with who I want to be as a person. Reading between the lines, happiness is a big part of this as well, right? Happiness is something that you, you aim to give your clients as well, right? Yes. In the name of making them better leaders at work. Because here, still, it, uh, executive coaching happens in the context of a professional, uh, uh, professional relationship, professional uh, set of duties. Uh, after all, I'm uh, engaged usually not by the clients uh, themselves, but uh, by the companies uh, that they run. So the focus is not on making them happy at the company's expense. Mm -hmm. uh, the focus is on making sure that they are the best they can be uh, at work. Mm, I see. And yes, becoming happier and becoming more fulfilled in the process is very much part of this. But uh, still, that the line between, let's say, executive coaching with a focus on the business context and business results, and let's say, life coaching, which uh, may focus on something else uh, entirely. So then when you deliver the results, um, that's the end? Um, maybe, maybe not. So one, so one thing which I think is really, really healthy in uh, coaching is agree a specific goal, what I call a big agenda, the overall direction of travel, and then agree when we are going to stop, uh, reassess how uh, we are doing on our, on our big agenda, and then possibly recommit to another uh, number, of, uh, number of sessions. So uh, while every specific session is usually focused on uh, a specific challenge or a specific uh, topic, uh, I'm, uh, as a coach, I always try to keep an eye on how, how what we're discussing today is, is linked to the overall big agenda that uh, matters, to, uh, matters uh, to the client. And then uh, at some point, we'll need to... Uh, stop and think, okay, how much progress we've made? Uh, does it work? Is the expense uh, justified? Uh, do you want to, uh, do you want to uh, recommit? So in, so in other words, I'm, uh, in other words, even if the relationship with the coach uh, takes place over, uh, over several months and continues on an on ongoing basis, it's still healthy to stop from time to time and to say, this is what we've done. These are the results that we achieved. Do we want to, uh, do we want to, uh, continue or, uh, or not? And by the way, no coaching relationship is meant to last forever. One of my jobs uh, as a coach is to help the client to achieve their goals and not need me anymore. So, you know, uh, when I, when I think of you and other people like you, you know, I think having a lot of spare time is the last thing that you have. I, you know, I imagine a lot of people that could benefit from something like this probably don't have the time or even the motivation to make the time. Um, what, what would you say to people like that? Because, I mean, you must have been in a similar position yourself. Uh, yes, being, uh, being a chief executive or a startup founder is an incredibly busy job. And carving out time to work on yourself sometimes when you've got very specific pressures like fundraising or hiring or uh, or building a new product uh, can feel like a, uh, a luxury 
However, I see it as a health check. We need to give ourselves rest and exercise and to uh, f- see doctors from time to time just to make sure that everything is fine and we are moving in the right direction so that we could perform at our best at uh, at all other times. Uh, as a CEO, in the moment, as a CEO, I remember there were moments when I just tried to uh, push myself forward and work as hard as I could uh, without really thinking about what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, uh, just focusing uh, focusing 100% on the task uh, ahead of me. And while I achieved some results, uh, I think, with the benefit of hindsight, I think that I could have achieved more and had, and I could have had maybe a slightly easier time doing it uh, if I stopped on the regular occasions to really reassess what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, how I'm doing it, how do I relate to all other people uh, around me, what are other options, what choices am I making without even thinking about it. Uh, and uh, this process of uh, self-reflection and making sure that I stay uh, stay on track uh, on on track to uh, uh, to achieve the outcomes I'm uh, uh, I'm looking for is uh, is uh, crucial to me. Now, in in coding, you'll know this, of course, much better than I do. There's a uh, thing called uh, rubber ducking, which you know they'll suggest to um, developers, you know, uh, to tech workers to say, you know, rubber duck. So if you're sitting on your own trying to figure out a problem. Um, the analogy is you get a little rubber, rubber duck and you talk to the rubber duck. So you're talking your problem out. And in that process, you actually overcome your problem. And I mean, it totally works. I've seen it work myself day after day, week after week. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy and not at the same time. Just trying to explain what you are doing and why you are doing to someone else um, can lead to dramatic results. And it leads to pretty positive outcomes, even with a rubber duck, which doesn't really do much. <laughs> if you if you imagine the very same process but with an experienced coach who can guide you uh, through all of this uh, hopefully it can be uh, a little bit more efficient uh, than uh, uh, talking to a rubber duck you're like the rolls royce of rubber ducks basically aren't you well, not not me but maybe me in 20 years <laughs> okay i'm sure i mean that's your modesty kicking in again um uh, your your fan club will never um, let me uh, uh, forgive myself if I don't uh, remind them how amazing you are. Yep, all three of them as I keep saying. <laughs> There's many, many more than three. Let me ask you a sideways question here. If you if you you, you had left Makers uh, and you weren't an executive coach now, um, what would uh, you be doing? If I weren't an executive coach, um, one part of me really wants to uh, go and meditate full time really as in just go in a long meditation retreat in a, some very quiet location and uh, spend a year or two just Ooh. just focusing on my inner world and learning how to uh learning how to really understand uh, uh understand what's happening in my uh, mind and body so that could be one uh, uh one theoretical option uh but maybe there are, I'm sure there are other ones. I, uh, I just never gave it, uh, I just haven't, I haven't given it too much thought because when I was leaving makers, I knew that, uh, I would be, uh, retraining and building my practice, uh, as an executive, as an executive coach. Meditation is, is a funny one because, I mean, you know, I started doing it uh, at Makers because, of course, you know, uh, at Makers, we had uh, Donna, who was our chief joy officer, you know, and joy, happiness, well-being. The, you know, this is a huge running theme, not only at boot camps, but at tech companies of all sizes, you know, and we used to meditate with her. And, my, you know, my personal experiences, um, I don't think I don't think it, 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 it reaches me the same way it reaches many other people. You know, I, I wish it had the effect on me. Like, I really tried even even in in my job, I used to meditate quite a lot. We used to run meditation groups, um, and I never felt like it reached me, like it reached other people. And it's okay, uh, Sanjay. There are lots of lots of ways lots of ways to get to know ourselves, and meditation is just uh, one of them. Mm. Uh, it works for some people. Uh, it uh, works maybe a bit less for uh, uh, for others. I had I had exactly the same relationship with uh, with yoga. Yeah, lots of people, as we all know, absolutely swear by yoga and, and love it for uh, all the uh, uh, spiritual and physical benefits that uh, a yoga practice uh, 
no, I can't breathe. And mm. I think I spent about maybe over a year having a really consistent yoga practice as in like four or five times uh, uh, a week, six o'clock morning sharp uh, uh, by join, joining an Ashtanga yoga class. And as much as I tried, I just never quite connected to that particular uh, practice, even though it's great for it, uh, for many other people and they learned something from it. Mm. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I couldn't find my way in uh, there. Okay, great. That makes me feel a lot better about myself. Like I'm not missing something. Well, it's as much as as much as I love meditation, I wouldn't go. I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that absolutely everyone should drop everything they are doing and sit on a cushion mm. for eight hours a day. Mm. Some people might, but maybe maybe it doesn't work for uh, everyone. Or absolutely. Maybe, or maybe not yet. Maybe a few years later, uh, you really uh, you'll realize that now it resonates. But in any case, I, in any case, I, I think it's totally fine. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, a strange question here. Have you ever considered being a monk? Um, I have. You have. I have, and okay. I, as you can tell, I haven't become a monk. No. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yes, it did. It did, it did cross my mind. Uh, I spent. Uh, I spent a bit of time on a few uh, meditation retreats uh, over the last uh, uh, over the last uh, the six or so years, and uh, I don't think I'm ready to commit to this path full time. And I hope that I will be able to bring more to the world by being in the world rather than uh, being in a uh, in a monastery. Um, this did cross my mind, yes. Okay. Uh, do you want to know why I asked that? Tell me more. Uh, I don't know. I, I've recently, I've been coming across a lot of people, a lot of people who are, you know, um, powerful people or who have, maybe not powerful, but, you know, uh, who have achieved a lot, uh, people at your level. Um, I, 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 a lot of them, like, have either been a monk or talk about being a monk, and I don't quite understand. Well... I see. I see the, uh, this path as an advanced degree in getting to know your mind. Mm. Uh, some people spend years in academia trying to get a PhD in one area to really, really understand one area, and others want to really understand how their mind works. And uh, one of the ways you can do it is by spending a lot of time observing, uh, observing how your mind works by having direct experience of. Uh, sitting on a cushion and uh, noting, okay, let's see what happens. Let's try to understand why. Let's see how all of this is connected. And the deeper you go, the more questions you have. It just gets mm. stranger and stranger. And uh, uh, whereas at first it felt like, oh, there are some thoughts and maybe a couple of emotions. Once you get a little bit deeper, an entire world opens up. Uh, and uh, this is incredibly fascinating to uh, to explore i guess the 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 takeaway from today is the importance of being mindful and self-reflection if it if it helps for me for me absolutely yes uh but uh, everyone has a different path in life and uh, i'm not here to prescribe anything to anyone and there's your executive coaching training coming up again <laughs> you know i my life experience uh, I guess that means uh, you know that uh, telling people what to do is not always the right advice. Uh, um, unless they specifically ask you for your advice in telling them what to do in this specific moment. Mm. Probably, uh, uh, probably not. Uh, there are, even in, even if, uh, in, in my work as a CEO, there are far better and far easier ways to get stuff done. Uh, than telling others uh, what to do. And I mean, you ran a fantastic organization. Every, anyone who's ever worked under you will um, will attest to that. So, I mean, I'll take your word for it. I'd like to think so. Before before we get to the joke, can I, can I give a couple of shout outs? Is that okay with you? Of course. Sorry to impose. I want to give a shout out to, to Kev La, who's my most prolific commenter on YouTube. He's also my best friend in real life. So, you know, he better keep commenting. 
Uh, I need to shout out to uh, Abby Travers, who you know as well. She's been a guest previously. She's one of the biggest fans of the show. Thank you very much for liking it uh, and sharing everything. And shout out to Matthew Sagar, who keeps resharing my posts. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any shout outs you'd like to give? Maybe to your fan club? Not off the top of my head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on the spot and I've got nothing to say. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I did put you on the spot there. Uh, shout out to Yevgeny's fan club, to the hundreds and thousands of you. Yeah, all three of them. <laughs> okay, before I let you go, I need a joke of the show. Uh, yep. So uh, two men uh, go to a bar for a drink and uh, one of them asks the other, so tell me about your son. He was unemployed. He still has no job. Oh, no, no, no. He's a meditator now. A meditator? What does it even mean? Well, to be honest, I don't really know myself, but I'm sure it's better than sitting and doing nothing. Uh, <laughs> the joke is it's probably not. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. Evgeny, thank you very much. You've been amazing. Uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for the invitation. Really enjoyed the conversation. Cheers. And I can't wait to see you for episode three. Looking forward. We, so season two, I'm going to wrap up season one soon and it'll be season two soon. And I'm, I'm, I'm pivoting with some cool ideas. I've got some crazy things coming up. Let's record episode three. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. You heard it here first, folks. And that's all, folks. Thanks a lot for tuning in. For more info, for questions, comments, or feedback, please head on over to aheadintech.com and don't forget to subscribe.